Hello and how's it world? My man, I've got such an awesome guest for you today. This is Moving the Needle, but you don't want to hear from me. I'm Andrew Nietling. Thanks so much for downloading wherever you get the Spotify pod, uh, Apple. I've seen those reviews. It's, it's pretty cool. And I was actually speaking off air on how challenging a podcast can be. So that's nice to hear it from a man that's done it himself. But a free ride legend, an icon of the sport, pushing it to its utmost boundaries back in the day. Then coming back to the sport, we meet each other at events. And uh, I am just so honored to have him in my presence because his energy is infectious. His, look out, his outlook on life is incredible. And I know we're going to share some laughs, but I, I think you're going to get some value. Brett Tippy, welcome to the show. How are we doing? I'm doing good, Needles. How are you? Thanks for having me on the show. And uh, amazing that we're around the world talking to each other like this and I guess sharing this with everybody else out there. Hi, everybody. Yeah. For uh, later down the road. This is amazing. I know. High tech rednecks. Yeah. But uh, I was, uh, I'm pretty solid with my intros these days, but you had me pretty nervous there. There was a couple fumbles, which you know, as a, as a live announcer, you got to, you got to push through it as if it was meant to be. But uh, man, yeah, it's not easy, is it's it? It's not easy, and and you one at least can no. relate. You can relate to podcasting. You relate to retiring from a career or two careers, uh, maybe having a hiatus, coming back, finding your own, getting sponsors, keeping them happy, launching a podcast. Um, mate, you have seen it, done it all. But what I love is just seeing you at events, is because it's nothing but positivity with you, and it seems like you've had that all your life or forced that into yourself but uh i love it dude and and i think this is over the internet i don't know right? if i force it into myself that sounds like uh, not quite correct is that not one of, <laughs> yeah that wouldn't be one of your dad jokes i know we're gonna have a few of those no no today. no i definitely didn't force it into myself <laughs> <laughs> uh, no it's uh it's uh why not be positive it's it's easier to be positive and um you know what? Like I've had a lot of experiences because um, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm catching you. I like I'm to get out there. You. Oh, I know. Well, you'll never catch me at this needles. You might be faster than me, but you won't catch me on the uh, the age battle. <laughs> but you know what they say? <laughs> everyone grows older, but not everyone truly uh, grows up. Okay. So yeah, you're in the latter there, right? Right. Totally. Yeah. Um, that's that one I heard. I don't want to age gracefully. I want to rage gracefully. Yeah, that would be, I think, in the latter years of your life, you'd probably be asking for that to be in your tombstone. You'd be like, guys, I yeah, just want totally. one thing. Let's put this on my tombstone. <laughs> that was who I was. The best tombstone I ever heard was, um, was it Merv Griffin, uh, TV talk show host? And he said, Merv Griffin will not be back after these messages. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. I was like, that's clever. Well, you've, it's been three minutes on the recording and you've dropped a dad joke. So we are, yeah, of course. We're good. We should just sign off now. There's not much else to talk about. I could tell you a few more dad jokes, but you'd probably just laugh. No, well, I would. Those are coming at the end. There's lots of uh, fan questions, and one of them is your best dad joke. Oh, my God. You know who's got good dad jokes and you'd never believe it? Is Brandon Semenuk. Really? Yeah, like, I never knew. Like, the first time I ever realized he had good dad jokes was I was walking by him at Rampage, and I, was, I grabbed Andreo's bike when we were YT teammates, and I grabbed his bike, and I'm pushing his bike up. And when I walked around Seminar, because he had a little uh, Red Bull TV crew around him and whatnot, and then I hear Tippy, and I look, and it's Brandon, and he goes, did you hear about the explosion at the cheese factory? I'm like, uh, no. He goes, there's nothing left but debris. <laughs> Dude, he gets you. Seminic. But he, I'm not surprised. He's a, To me, he's a silent assassin. So like, yeah, even totally. a dad joke, he just come at you and you wouldn't expect it at all. Oh, I know. It was awesome. So I said to him, I go, huh, that's awesome. I, did you hear about the world's dumbest criminal? They asked him to blow up a car and he burnt his lips on the tailpipe. <laughs> <laughs> so we went back and forth about five times. And the Red Bull TV crew was like, <laughs> it was so funny. And then actually, um, after Rampage was over, at the after party, me, Brandon, and uh, Justin Wiper, actually, one of his diggers, had a joke telling, I wouldn't say a battle. Well, for, for me, it wasn't a battle. It was a jam. 
But we had this joke telling spree for like, I don't know, 15 minutes. It's all three of us going around. And then at the end, Brandon's like, Ugh, I can't beat you at jokes. And I'm like, I didn't know it was a competition. I thought we were just having a jam session. But for him, it was a competition because he's he's so competitive. But anyways, it was kind of a, a, a wild moment to really see the humor that Brandon actually has up there, you know. So it was pretty cool. He's a funny dude. Yeah, man. I don't think he gets to let out his um, character as much. He's obviously got the video projects, which shows like his creativity and he works with his builders. But, you know, when he was at the top of the sport... Uh, you know, you have to be so serious and it seems like you don't want to let your guard down that you're fun and you got jokes. Like he was, like I said, he's, to me, he's a silent assassin. Just lets the writing do the yeah, talking totally. and w what a, I mean, he's got to be one of the most <clears throat> gifted person you've ever seen on a bike. Yeah. Like, I, I would down. say, even though he's not competing, he's still the top of the sport, even though he's not competing. Yeah. You know, like he's, he, what did he, he just got a third in rampage and it, um, and he got there late because he was, you know, winning the North American Rally Car Championships. Just quickly does that. And then that, he won yeah. the year before. Yeah, I'm just going to quickly do this. Um, so I would still say he is, he's still the top of the sport, even though he's not, you know, doing much more than Rampage for competitive riding and mountain biking. But his edits are, are mind-blowing. And um, there's not many people out there who have even close to as much style as him. It was funny though, <clears throat> speaking of dad jokes, um, when he won Rampage uh, two Rampages ago, like Brett Reeder won the last one, and then the time before, the Rampage before Semenek won, I was interviewing him for Pink Bike, and I said, well, you got here, um, and you had to choose between the rally championships, racing cars, or come to Rampage, and you decided to come to Rampage, and you won, so congratulations, you know, like, your run was amazing, the 25-foot tail whip, this was all awesome, blah, 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 and then... He's like, yeah, and we talked a little bit. And at the end, I put, I put, grab his wrist and hold his hand up, you know, boxing style, like it did to your wrist when you won the air downhill at Crankworks and, and beat uh, Lopes in his six, five year streak or something. Anyway, so I grab his hand and I throw it up. And, uh, and I'm like, congratulations, Brandon Summit McGrennan, the Red Bull Rampage. And then I put his hand down and I look at him and I go, hey, Brandon, you know how you know when you're a good rally car racer? And he's like, no, Tiffy, when? I go, when you've got splattered bugs. On the side of your car, <laughs> and Dude, the he editors must have loved that. Ed oh, he he laughed. Dude, that's he a he, great he laughed one. out loud. It was so specific to the situation, and then the editors never put it in the show. And I was like, "Why?" It was perfect. We had someone like laughing. I told a good specific dad joke, and they never put it in. I couldn't believe it. This is for Pink Bike or for Red Bull. That was for Pinkbike. Yeah, bike. but that's your gig, dude. Huh? That's like that's part of the well, Pinkbike thing. What if I don't edit though? I don't no, edit. Fair yeah, I, I just I, I just do it and then hand the footage off. But at the last rampage, where when Brett Reeder won, um, he won you know the competition, but he also uh, won with his team, his diggers won the best digger award, best diggers, best dig team actually award. And so after I did the old uh, interview with Reader, you know, congratulations on winning the Red Bull Rampage, and grabbed it just the end, yay! I said to him, I go, hey, Brett, how do you confuse your Rampage diggers? And he's like, I don't know how. I go, you point to a shovel and a spade, and you tell them to take their pick. <laughs> Dude, where do you come up with these things? I, <laughs> he laughed his face off. It was awesome, and they put it in this time. That's great. I don't know where I get it. I'm literally yeah. sitting. I don't know where I'm I get it. Sitting on the side here, going, "Well, I'm just going to fake laugh if I don't get these jokes." So sometimes I don't get them. Yeah, like, right. You put a lot of thought and effort into. It. So you did those pink bike uh, event uh, announcing and these like recap videos, which were awesome. I, I know they got a lot of reach. Do you remember being so overworked in a certain Rotorua in New Zealand and what happened in the media room? Because your memory seems good. Yes, I remember. Yes, I remember actually being sleep deprived. I was running on three and a half, four hours, and three hours sleep for three days in a row. So I was running on like nine hours sleep over three days, and then I had to go back out and hit another event. And I just had a little nap on by like on the floor by a beanbag. Yeah, and that's weird. Like, was I the roof leaking? Like you were f just caked in water? No, the roof. 
No, it was you had a little cup of, uh, no, would you have a water bottle and you sprayed me with water. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, but I had I, a great, I, said, I had uh, a great chirp. I don't know if you remember the chirp. Well, you said, uh, what are you doing? And I can't remember exactly what you said, but I think I said, I'm just crying in the rain. Oh, <laughs> Because it was very rainy. I feel like I said this might be the f like the only 10 minutes I've ever seen you quiet in my life or something like that. Oh, I hope right. I said that. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> but that's you know what I was that's thinking? rich coming from me. So I'll just put yes. that out well, there that... to the world out there. I'm not scared well of played. having a well chat played, and having a bit of banter. Well, you've got to get through these <laughs> events, right? They're super fun. But, you know, you go... Well, uh, it was... People don't understand how hard it is, actually, because now, now you know, you've been a pro racer for a long time. You raced World Cup and you raced Crankworks, um, and then now you're doing some announcing, and I know that you can appreciate it because you're doing it, but um, I hear people's comments on the announcers and for different things and whatnot, and I just hear people talking, but people don't realize how actually hard it is. Even if you know the sport inside and out and you know the riders and you know everything, it's not as easy as people think. It's actually way harder. And the timing and the delivery and keeping all your notes straight and just all the little parameters that it takes to do put on a good show is quite more uh, challenging than, than people would ever imagine, right? Huh? Yeah, I would certainly agree. I think it's a lesson to all of us, like not judge unless you walked a, what is it, a, a few steps in their shoes, you know, and and 100%, like, from live to on site, I guess you know the guys, but man, it's nerve wracking, right? It, it's it's like yeah, it's like and you've got a, you've got them going saying something oh, in your ear. Yeah, okay, we've got worst. a commercial break in twenty seconds. Wrap it up, wrap it up. Say something about the winner. Say something about the winner. Okay, all right. No, wait, it's in fifteen seconds. Okay, cut, cut, cut. And you're like trying to like listen and then and keep it flowing and then also like be accurate in your representation of what's going on in that event. And yeah, it's. It's actually quite hard. I wasn't I wasn't briefed on that when the producer would speak to you and, and, and he would say wrap it up. But all he means is, you know, don't go on a crazy tangent, but get what you're saying. And the first time I no you know, no one prepped me. Wrap it up and I just went mid sentence, I went quiet. No, finish what you're saying. <laughs> so then I would carry on. He's like, Okay, wrap it up. I'm like, Right. What what do you want me to do here? Like, is it either wrap it up or finish? Right. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean, announcing on live broadcast, it's really difficult. And, uh, the, and where, when it seems seamless, that guy's got a lot of experience, but it, it's so difficult. Like you said, there's a producer there. There's certain things you've got to speak about. There's a, there's a story you've got to tell to a very educated, passionate fan, which you want to, you know, make sure that they are, uh, entertained. But what about the newbie that comes onto a broadcast or gets told to watch? You've this got to not totally you've it. got to not lose them. So it's a super fine art and, and and you were doing those those videos where you were helping your videographer edit or probably come up with a script and you know, like you say, you, you go into these events and you've got a lot of videos to get done and not a lot of time and you've got to fit in with the athletes and the schedule. So um no, of course people don't appreciate it unless they've been there in the trenches with you. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's uh it's easy. And it's funny you say you, you have to talk to someone who's super dialed and super knowledgeable and then someone who's a newbie. And I actually got some really good advice um, from a friend of mine. I used to work for a CTV Sportsnet um, doing World Cup of Snowboarding. I did that for four years. And then I did four years of a free ride show called The Sacred Ride. And so even before I ever came to Crankworks and started doing Rampage and all the different shows, I had eight years of experience doing these two different shows. And one of the guys said, okay, when you're announcing, talk to three different people. Imagine in your head, you're talking to three different people. You're talking to your super dialed, super pro friend who knows everything. He's, he's done it. He's raced it. He's been there. Then talk to your friend who's a total beginner. And then they just need to be have everything broken down. And then talk in the middle to your grandma who kind of knows a little bit, but she doesn't know all the exact terminology. And so you talk to either end of the spectrum and then your grandma in the middle. <laughs> and I was like... Because my grandma was pretty rad. And, uh, you know, she would get it and she would, she would get some jokes. And then I talked to your super pro friend and your, your super uh, greenhorn rookie friend. And then you've got it covered. And so it's funny that you say that because that's what I did too. Yeah, no, no, it is. And I think, I think if you explain it like that, people go, okay, that's a little bit more challenging trying to speak to three different spectrums of people or knowledge base. 
Yeah, I um, whew, yeah, it was tough, but it's a it's a beautiful place to be. I think once you accept you're not going to compete and you're trying to educate these people. Well, you've got a you've got a thought process. Let's hear it. Uh, I have a question for you. Like, question so for me. I, I now... like this because you're a podcaster yeah. or a former podcaster. I didn't know it had stopped, so right. we can talk about that. Yeah, okay. well, I, I did. I did fifty. Why did don't 50, you co-host with me? Know. Hit me up. Right. Okay. Well, I know I've had some tough interviews, and some people are super easy to interview. Like, you know, you were easy to interview because you were knowledgeable, and then you spoke, and then you didn't go too long and whatnot. Like someone like Bernard Kerr is actually, you know, very good. He, he has his thought. He puts it out there, and then he caps it. Cedric Gracia went forever. Like, yeah, he would, yeah. like, it's a six, seven-minute video. He, he wouldn't stop. He was one, one of my toughest interviews because I couldn't get the mic back from him. I, like... <laughs> Um, Sam Hill was, was tough until I got to know him a little bit better. Cause you know, like I was kind of intimidated and scared and he didn't have much, much to say, you know, and I was like, Oh, and then Brandon at the beginning until we became, you know, better friends was some of my toughest interviews, but who have been your toughest interviews to, to, to interview when you were talking to different athletes? Well, you speak off the top of the head. And who was and who was the, who was the easiest? I think to I, I think those guys you mentioned. You know, Bernard's easy. The guys that will talk. Uh, Cedric, of course, is great. The, I mean, just off the top of my head, I remember changing roles and doing the finish area of a slope style, and there was a it was tough. There was a Brett Reader, but that was when Brett Reader was going through some challenges, and he was quite raw and emotional, and that was tough. That was tough because once he got going, I was told to wrap it up. Let's get, you know, let's move on or whatever. And and that was tough for me because I wanted to give him the space to speak about what's, you know, he's about to get raw. You know, I don't think we should wrap this yeah. up, but it, it, it's TV. So there was a time limit. So I've, right. I know Brett a little bit, but I, if you don't know them well enough and they don't trust you, it, it can be very tough. Like a Sam Hill. I know him very well. So I'd be comfortable with Sam. But if you don't yeah. know them, but you have a lot of knowledge, uh, you know, someone like Brandon Semenik, he needs to trust that person at there. And I think that's why it's so critical that that we've been there, done that, and, and built these relations because I want them to be able to trust me because I'm only there for their uh, the positivity of their career or the show, you know. Like, I got nothing to gain anymore. I, I'm thankful for right. what I had. So um, I think sometimes, you know, you don't – I think – if you're at the top of the sport, you might have your guard up that someone wants to get some clickbait stuff or something like that, you know? Right, right. And you know what? One of the arts of, of, of doing these things is the timing. Yes. Like if someone's like, obviously, you don't ask someone for a quick word when they're ready to drop into the gate, you know, like right before their run. You got, and you, the, people have a certain prep time before they do their run um, that you can't interrupt or else they're going to think you're a. You're a dick, yeah, right? Yeah, hundred percent. Right, and and you also, and if someone crashes, you don't want to hit them right after another crash. Oh, what happened there? And and be like right in the, on their face with the mic, you know. And um, but at the same time, you have to do your job, and you have to get stuff that's that's entertaining and informative. And so you have to talk to them at some point, but you have to really, really pick and choose your timing for them to like give you the time of day the next time, because um, you know. It's, it's painful and it's 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 hard to be a competitor and you have your ups and downs and if you can really pick and choose your moments you can do a much better job yeah and also you're there to do a certain job right so yes there's timing but like you've got to tell the story you know and you don't want to lose them right. like it's it's like someone will say are you friends with them now luckily we are friends with them before um are we going to keep some of them as friends well if you're unbiased and you're telling the story like on a commentator, like if you're in the broadcast, I've got to call the screen. If someone crashed and it looked like it was under pressure, I have to call the. I I, I don't judge them. <laughs> I'm the first to have crashed under pressure, so it's not a judgmental statement. But it's right. a really fine line, you know. You've got to tell the story, and at the finish line as well, like they probably don't want to speak about the crash. They we know they're angry, but your job is to ask them about that emotion even though they don't want to cover the event so often to be like fuck to be like what why are you going to do that dude like but your job in that specific moment at that event is to ask the hard question right it's true and it's um it's a fine line and so uh i, I don't know i think i think if you have respect 
to the racer's time, you know, um, and, and, and the timing, they will give you the time of day. Um, I remember <laughs> my favorite interview ever was uh, Kelly McGarry. And I saw Kelly McGarry standing at the top of the slope style at Crankworks Whistler, and he's looking down at his elbows, and he's got, like, two big, massive wounds that are just dripping blood. And then he's got, underneath them, two big, older scab marks. And then he's got, like, that are healed, like, maybe, like, three or four days. And, like, and then the fresh ones. And then he's got these old ones <laughs> that were, like, like, a week and a half old that were just, like, still, like, pink, you know? So he's got three different ages of, of crashes in his elbows, and he's dripping blood going, ugh. And I say to my cameraman, I'm like, roll camera, roll camera, roll camera. And I just roll up on him, and I'm like, Kelly. And he's like, hey, Tippy. And I go, Kelly, why don't you wear elbow pads? <laughs> and he goes, Tippy, <laughs> two kinds of people wear elbow pads. <laughs> Pussies and smart people. And I eat either one of them. <laughs> Oh, man, that's priceless, man. It was gold, gold. I just went like, like I'm like. You're like, I don't even know if I could well, have I... made that up. Right, that's totally. Brilliant. Like, that was the best. Yeah, my God. So, yeah, it's a, it's a strange thing being on the mic. Um, and, you know, some people get nervous and some people freeze up. Like, I, I don't think that happens to me. That, that doesn't happen to you. Um, although you always have a, a tough moment where, you don't know quite the right question to ask because you might have several questions to ask and you only have a chance to to do two or yeah. three uh, questions. So you've got to be selective. And then sometimes the athlete will take longer than you expect to answer. So you kind of lose your second question or they might end it real quick. Then you've got to come up with like three or four. It's So it's, it's very um, improvisational and you got to be quick on your feet to, to do a good job. Yeah, hundred percent. And and I mean, obviously, we're in a little bit different phases of post career, right? I mean, you you're probably very comfortable with your role in the industry and and stuff, and being able to like really look back on your career now. Like for me as well, I'm I'm very comfortable to be like that was the past. That's what I did do. Thankful, great. Whether I got third, fifth, first at that race, you mentioned like what what a great memory you have, like. For me, that's just something that happened in the past, and I'm thankful for it. And, and it seems like for you as well, like you're so far along this this path to like look back at the career you had. Uh, I remember, I remember the look on your face. I was standing there, and we we're waiting for the results because you came down, had a smoker run. You were in the hot seat um, in the air downhill at Crankworx Whistler, probably like 2016, maybe. I think it was maybe earlier than that, but your your memory's better than mine. Yeah, it was back on yeah, was uh, well, back on maybe, trying. So you would have been in the finish area of doing the interviews, right? Right. And so you're in the hot seat, came down with a smoking time, you had the fastest time going, but Brian Loft was still yet to come down. He was the last uh, rider down and he had won it like I think five times in a row. Maybe six. Or he was going for a sixth. He run it five times in a row. And he was on a heater and <laughs> as he crossed the line and his time came up. It was slower than yours, and you realized that you broke the Brian Lope streak, and you won the air downhill, and you're like, and I saw you go, yes! <laughs> you were just so stoked, and you didn't know which way it was going to go, and that moment where you beat Brian Lopes, and you won in the air downhill was just like, I could see it. I was like three feet from you, and this, this you going, yes! That, com that competitive, raw caveman, raw! <laughs> it's in your eyes I even it was remember awesome half of that but i do know if i get to beat lopes and he'll respect this that is like worth celebration like whether you win or lose when he was being able to do what he did at that age and and he would rub it rub it in our noses as a youngster but look i got actually taken under his wing quite a lot uh staying in SoCal. so yeah a lot of, you know, he was yeah. able to rub people up the wrong way. You would know that, but you would be rooting for him. He's like, you know, like you want the old guy to still smoke it. Like watching, I'm watching the surf series, right? And I'm like, dude, this Kelly Slater thing and this Craig Menard thing and Lopes at the time. So when he's yeah. so dominant, uh, it, it is cool because we were friends enough to me be like, yeah, that that's cool. But I don't even remember half of that, right? 
but uh that's cool to relive that through you but for you did that like it is quite exhilarating being an announcer or like when these sort of memories <coughs> happen, right because you feel part of it again yeah yeah totally i actually had a very good result um last spring as an old guy where um there's a snowboard yeah, race the snowboard, in canada I, read, I just read about that didn't you just yeah. take a title or a some win no i i I well, I didn't win. I actually got um, the third fastest time in the biggest bank slalom race in Canada against all the top dudes. The national team was there, all the up and comers, young hot shots, all the big mountain riders, all the racers. You know, like there's there's over 300 racers at this event, and um, it's like it's been going for 26 years. It's the longest running bank slalom in Canada. Um, it's called the Neil Edgeworth after. He was actually a friend of mine back in the day that died in an avalanche in Chamonix, France. Um, but they have a race in his honor called the Neil Edgeworth Memorial Bank Slalom. And it's at Big White. Um, actually, I'm actually in kind of a Big White Cup right now. Um, and I entered 50 plus and I won 50 plus. But I also beat every single racer there <laughs> except for two pros. To, and I, I would actually would have been third in pro, and I was third. I was the third oldest guy there, and I got the third fastest time. That's epic. <laughs> and and all the guys on the national team were like, "Tippy, you're making us look bad in front of our coach. <laughs> like, dude, you're supposed to be the announcer." <laughs> and I'm like, "I know, but <laughs> hey, I've raced a long time. I've been snowboarding a long time, and." It was like a, it was a pretty easy course. And actually, granted, it was pretty good for like a big guy or a fat guy. And uh, so it, it was like 18 giant berms that were pretty uniform. And then they had like uh, the last seven turns down the half pipe instead of his normal gully that they normally use. And I saw the course and I, I used to race giant slalom, World Cup. And so it was pretty much like a giant slalom with like slight banks. I'm looking at it and I was like, I'm going to kick ass here. And then I pulled out, and you know all those little tiny micro terrains where you pump the little yeah. micro terrain, and all the little risks. I just took a risk on every single turn. I didn't make any mistakes, and I was like coming into the last seven turns into the half pipe, and I was like, "Oh my god, I'm on a heater!" Like I was tucking, I was like, no skips, no sketches, anything. I'm like, "I'm on a heater. I should play it smart here." And then at the last minute, I'm like, "Screw it!" And I pre hopped into the half pipe, and I caught the backside of the of the transition. And I pumped it and I barely made the last seven turns and I crossed the finish line with so much speed. I couldn't even barely stop in the finish area. And I'm like, oh my God, I just kicked ass, I think. And it turns out I got beaten by two pros, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I almost broke my arm patting myself on the back. <laughs> when, uh, when last did you do a competitive event on anything, bike or that? Oh, I, I do. I do the bank slums every year, okay. so and you, um, little, you keep keep a little bit active there in the in the snow scene. Yeah, I, I the bank the bank slums I do because they're fun, and and they have a mix of the racers, the border crossers, the half pipe guys will even come in, the big mountain free riders. Everyone comes up and does the bank slums, and um, um, a couple of feathers in my cap is uh, uh, I did the Mount Baker bank slalom, which is the number one bank slalom in the world. Yeah. And snowboarding, it's one of the big three in the world. Like, in snowboarding, the, the big three events are the Olympics, the X Games, and the Mount Baker Bank Slalom. And the Mount Baker Bank Slalom is the original snowboard race that that started, you know, in the 80s. And um, I got uh, – they, they don't have trophies. They give away duct tape because that was what people, you know, used to fix their bindings in, in the old days. And so they have gold, silver, and bronze duct tape bolted to a rock and it's the most valuable duct tape that you can win in snowboarding. And uh, I got two bronze duct tapes in Masters. Um, so I got a couple podiums, a couple thirds. And uh, those are the best trophies that I've ever got um, that actually, you know, uh, put me on the world stage a little bit, like as a Masters older guy. Um, I raced pro back in the day, and I think I got 11th a couple times and an 18th. Racing, you know, my heroes, Sean Palmer and Palmer and, was and there Craig back in Kelly the day and, at this bank slalom thing. Yeah, yeah, he he won it once, I think, uh, back in the in the eighties. So you cross, and then he's you, had some other you cross paths with him back in the day in your snowboard, like in that ski snowboard career. Yes, yes, actually, um, I have actually beaten Palmer a few days, a few times, 
back in the uh, the nineties. Uh, not very many times. He was really fast, but uh, you know, I was fast too. But I I got him a couple times in some like uh, obstacle races and um, a few border crosses where he actually crashed and I didn't. So um, it didn't happen very often. But yeah, I've beaten the palm. That's a few not times. bad to have in your resume. I know. Right? Well, That's like funny. me beating loaves. You're like, hey, it had to happen. Right? Exactly. Yeah, or right Manor, here in my belt. Like, like, more I, like Manar. Like, oh, well, loaves or Manar. They were both do, doing pretty right. incredible stuff. Like, however it happened, there's no pictures on the on the timing sheet, right? It's just the right, exactly. time. They might not remember, but I remember. <laughs> Actually, they, when, I, when I first met... not remember. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, <laughs> whatever, dude. You can have that one. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. When I met Palmer, um, I actually, I got 11th in the Super G. So I got wasted that night, got super drunk. And then I showed up late for border cross training and they wouldn't let me down the course to train. And I was like, well, can I inspect the course? And he goes, this big, massive Hawaiian dude. And he's like, go down the side of the course. Don't ride down the course. I'm like, okay, okay. And I, I went down the course and I'm like, double, double, berm, double, double, berm, ridge, spine, giant triples in the finish line. And I get to the bottom, and I'm in the lineup, and I see this snowboarder I knew, Andy Hetzel, and he's like, Tippy! And I'm like, hey, Hetz. And he goes, you do the triples? And I go, no, I inspected the course. And uh, Palmer was standing next to him, turns around. I never met him before. He turns around in this packed lineup. He goes, are you pussy? And I'm like, and I go, I am what I eat. And he goes, And so he didn't know what to do. So then uh, he didn't get on the chair with those guys. He actually got on the chair with me. And then he sits down next to me and he looks over and he goes, who are you anyhow? I go, I'm Tippy from BC. And he goes, well, Tippy from BC, you burn them? I'm like, yeah. He pulls out a stick and he burns it with me on the chair. Really? You had a blunt on the chair? <laughs> that's, yeah. Is that the That's how I met. That how you met Palmer. That's how I met Palmer. Dude, yeah. he's like a, he's such a living legend on this podcast and he hasn't been on, you know, like, I don't, I right. don't know if he'll do it ever, you know, and uh, I shared some texts with him and he's back e-biking and stuff and um, that's crazy. That's was awesome. that the scene back there? Like roller plant back before it was oh, serious? Oh, yeah. Like, well, snowboarding, it was just hand in hand, like, you know, it was just part part and parcel of the whole of the whole scene not for everybody no, but no. I, definitely for I me mean, this is way back it, way back don't mean to age you too much way no it way, was way back it was the 90s the 90s of course <laughs> it is so did you finish your like snowboard career and then get into mountain biking or was it like a because like you at the really early days like the forefront of free ride mountain biking right and i need to get that year it was probably before i yeah. picked up a mountain bike but how did that work? How did that transition work? Was it planned? Were you just so like I was like overlapping for, sure. for fun or overlapping? Yeah, I started. I first tried mountain biking in 1981. Um, a guy, a gnarly guy from Kamloops, BC, was named Craig Olson, and he got the first production mountain bike that was made. Whatever. A specialized stump jumper. Whatever. Like yeah. proper mountain bike. It was, like a yeah, like ever. It was like there there was some um some hand built like breezes around and stuff, but the first mountain bike that was like a production mountain bike was a specialized tump jumper and my buddy got one and then in nineteen eighty one we were driving that in my back alley and then riding the hills down behind my parents' house into the backyard, which is quite steep and aggressive. And I that was the first free riding that I ever did was like just no trail, raw dog in it, down through the bush into my parents' backyard. And it was scary. Um I also tried snowboarding in 1981, um, but it took me two years to save up enough money to buy a mountain bike. So I bought one in 1983, a Kuahara, and then um, I actually made a snowboard in 1983. So I started actually really going for it in 1983, but I tried both of the sports in 81. And then through the 80s, um, I mainly focused on, on snowboarding. And mountain biked a bit for fun, some rowdy stuff like riding shoots and some some stuff that I guess was like the earliest, some of the earliest free riding that was happening in the world. I didn't know it. I thought everyone just did this. But like you wouldn't have known, right? Because um, there's no magazines, no obviously there was no, no internet, magazines. You would have not known. There was no movies. There was nothing. There was just like you and your buddies. There was mountain bikes. 
yeah, me and my buddies were just riding down these steep hills, and um, I was snowboarding, you know, at the same time with no photos, no video, like no one had phones, there's no cell phones yet. It was just, just doing it. And um, I started competing uh, as an amateur in the 80s, and then um, I went pro snowboarding in 1991 when I met Craig Kelly, another one of my heroes, and he actually talked me into it. He saw me ride, and he's like, dude, you should race. And I'm like, really? And we actually got in a fight when we first met, me and Craig Kelly, one of my heroes, because I poached one of his lines because I didn't think he was going to show up for a shoot, so I just wrote it. And then he kneed me and Charlie horsed me in the thigh with his knee, and I threw him in a headlock and ran him into my fridge. And um, then I explained what happened, and then we became friends. And uh, I think I might be the only person in the world that has run the six-time world champion Craig Kelly's head into a fridge. <laughs> my hero. <laughs> Anyways, he ended up selling me his downhill suit and talked me into racing pro. So I went pro in 1991, and I finished seventh on the U.S. circuit against Palmer, against Craig Kelly, against Mike Chico like against Mark Fawcett, all the fast guys. And I was uh, top ten in the in the states, coming from Canada. But I was like seventh in the in the pro circuit, and so I started racing World Cup in '93. And actually, in my first World Cup, I got the second fastest qualifying time against everybody. And they're like, "Who's this guy?" And I'm like, "And then I thought I was going to win, and Nate then I ended up from blowing." BC, I think I got, tip, I'm tippy from, from BC, <laughs> but that's all I did was rode. I rode all the time. I I rode like. What were you doing for um, work at the time? Like, how did you have the time to do it? I was. I, well, I tree planted all summer, and then I would snowboard all winter. And snowboarding like was snow my main bump, thing, like as they call it, right? Like yeah, I was like a, to like, like, like a, snowboard a, and pursue your career, but like, right, okay, yeah. And so mountain biking just for fun, um, but actually doing really like steep lines because that's what we got for, you know, that's what we got a rush from, and um, you know, like I wanted to snowboard so bad in the summer, but I couldn't afford to go to South America or go to New Zealand or to the glaciers uh, in Europe where all my competitors are racing. So I used just to gravel board. I used to take my snowboard down the gravel pits and train in the gravel pits. And if you crashed, it hurt. You get all, you know, strawberried up and caught up. And and so you actually got quite good. And then I would take my mountain bike down these pits um, for fun too. And that's what actually led to early free riding. Um, was like riding our bikes down these gravel pits and down the clay hills and and counts. It used to be a lake and now it's like a river down the bottom. So it's left these giant steep vertical clay walls and chutes and cliff drops everywhere. And so we were just like horsing around mountain biking when we weren't sandboarding in the summer when we were working planting trees. And uh, it became like another sport. And so I went pro snowboarding in 91 and then... Um, through a series of events, uh, I actually went pro mountain biking in 90, the fall of 97. And um, it was uh, just a crazy time. And uh, yeah, it was it was super fun. What, what, what can you tell me about that crazy time? Because this is just like at the beginning oh, of dude. free ride mountain biking, no rules, probably not a lot of corporate. Like what are we, what are we talking Nothing. about? Nothing. It was... So... Calumps, like I say, is is a lot of clay. And so, you know, if you go higher up into the hills, it's like typical BC forest with, with rockier terrain and pine forests and, and whatnot. But down low in Calumps is all clay. And so if you crash and plant your face into the ground, you're, you're not going to be all cut up like you would be if it was rocks. You're not going mi to have missing teeth and like scratch to hell because it was clay. And so we could try really quite aggressive, steep lines with less consequences than most of the places in BC that were rockier. And so, you know, we would jump off cliffs. Like, I remember, like, I remember riding steep lines in 81, but in 84, I was in high school, I was jumping, um, we called them ledges, if they were head high or smaller, and if they were head high or taller, there were cliffs. And so I was like, like five foot 10. And so I was doing like six, seven footers which were cliffs because it was like overhead high on these giant mountain bikes that were, had no suspension, fully rigid. And I would nut myself so bad when you slip a pedal or something. And the top tube was so high. It, the pain was just amazing. And like literally like crashing, no helmets. No helmets and, back then. Yeah. We didn't wear helmets back then. It was just 
No one did that. Yeah. And so no armor, no helmets. And uh, you would, you, we would just chuck ourselves off things. <laughs> and, you know, like, Calus is kind of a redneck town. And if you want to be cool and if you want to kiss the pretty girls, you got to be kind of gnarly because all your buddies were gnarly. And then and if, and if you weren't doing gnarly things, then your buddies would be kissing the pretty girls. So I did gnarly things just so I could, like, hang out with the, the hot ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that crazy? And all my, if you think about now, if you think about kissing the pretty lady now, like having to do gnarly, stupid shit. Right. I know. It was. It was. Well, it was like it was a lot of one-upsmanship, and you know, that was that was the the dating mating scene. Yeah. No, it is day. when you're young. When you're younger, it kind of is as well oh, as yeah. you think it is the only way. Right. And my dad moved around a lot, and my mom and dad, and so I was like the new kid in, in town all the time. And so I would move to a new town, and if the kids were jumping a garbage can, I would jump two. And if they did two, then I would do three, just so I could be accepted and be cool with the, with the new gang. And so it was always like a little bit of like, okay, well, what's the gnarly shit you got going on? And then you try and beat it so that you could be like part of the cool club, I guess. You know what I mean? So as kids, that's what we did. And then that kind of like like lasted into our young adulthood. <laughs> <laughs> Slash old adulthood. Do you think... <laughs> I mean, I would say it helped with my confidence, whether it was real or not. Being able to succeed at something and work hard, and I was obviously known as the bike kid, and I'm barely outliving that that tagline here. Yeah, at my age now, yeah. it's like I'm the bike guy in my town or whatever. I right? put the bike oh, shop sure. and I went overseas. But thinking back now, when you explain that, like a lot of it is still good. Like it helps you develop as a man. And, and have some sort of confidence, I think. 100%. Yeah, you know, we have this 100%. weird competitive to excel at something, to get the pretty lady or whatever it may be. Yeah, it, it's like, you know, we're dudes and we're like inherently competitive down to a base level, you know. Like our, our number one um, uh, operation as a human is survival. Yeah, yeah I was going to say and number survival, two 100%. Is, yeah, survival is number one instinct, basic instinct. Number two is procreation, you know, uh, passing on your genes to the next generation and whatnot. And um, people have done a lot of crazy things for love. And, you know, a lot of us love to ride. <laughs> so you end up doing crazy things. And um, that, was, that was definitely our story. Um, you know, I, I knew some girls that were into mountain biking and, and, and skiing and snowboarding. And, you know, they hung out with all the badasses and all my friends were badasses. So um, it all just seemed to just like roll on and snowball into all this crazy stuff that went down because everyone I knew was crazy. And uh, <laughs> it was a lot of fun, but it was actually definitely scary because if you didn't do it, one of your friends was. And so it was kind of like. All right, what's gonna to happen today? <laughs> who's gonna Who's gonna lose some teeth? <laughs> who's gonna be bleeding today? <laughs> oh my goodness! I would pay to be a fly on the wall during during those times. And then it goes from that, like trying to get the pretty girl and not lose teeth. But you guys sort of, when did the fro riders come about? Like how deep into this mountain bike random oh, that came way scene? Later. Like way where, later. Like fill me in because you were part of the first official free ride team right and and i yeah, think I that's really the, the first... really cool like to be able to chat to you and talk shit and yes you're announcing now and you know you've got this other role in the industry but you know free ride mountain biking is a huge part of our sport and always will be and, and pushing these boundaries yeah. to be part of like the first official team is like pretty damn cool <clears throat> it, it was all happening way before then but you know like i say we, we didn't get anything on camera for a long time you know like I, we were literally riding steep lines in 81, dropping clips in 84. I have footage that's coming out in the new free ride entertainment movie, the guy, uh, Derek Wesson, who made all the new World Disorder movies. And I gave him some footage I have of a bunch of my buddies riding these steep couars in like 87, maybe 80, probably 1987. And they are like crashing hard. And it's like, it's like a 50 degree shoot with corners and they're going end over and no helmets no suspension. It's nuts. And, um, like, and through the 90s, you know, we were doing 
stuff. I actually just, um, here, I'll show you. I just found a t-shirt that I painted in 1993. I'll show you. I just put it on my Instagram of me picturing dropping cliffs. Oh, we got to use that. In pic. 1993. You sent me that pic. We'll use so that, it. oh, will do. That, that's that t-shirt that I hand painted. Um, and it was just me imagining dropping cliffs. And um, so that was in 93. And then in 1995, I was actually in uh, Whistler and I ran into a guy named Greg Stump who made the best ski movies of the time. He made the super rowdy extreme movies. And um, a lot of sports were transitioning from competition to free riding. Skiing had done it with a, with a movie called um, The Good, The Rad, and The Gnarly. And then uh, The Blizzard of Oz was the one that really broke open the mold. Um, snowboarding, they had like um, the Totally Board series. Totally Board 1, Totally Board 2. And they just called them TB3, TB4, all the way through. Um, dirt biking had Crusty Demons yeah, of Dirt. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so all these sports were transitioning from racing on the clock to free riding, which hadn't really been done in, in, in action sports yet. And, you know, things go through different waves, but so that, that was happening then. And it hadn't happened to mountain biking. Everyone was focusing on, you know, people on the clock and, uh, John Tomac and, and Tinker Juarez, you know, racing cross country and, and Greg Herbold and all these, these old legends were, were racing their hearts out. But there was no, there was nothing about free riding in, in any of the media. There was magazines by then. Um, there, there was a few movies out, like uh, there was a movie called Tread that came out and had Hans Ray doing a little bit of trials in it, which was kind of like an early free riding, but it was more trials. And, and Chainsmoke, and you then, remember that movie Chainsmoke? Is that after this as well? Chainsmoke. After. Yeah, that came out. That came out in '96, okay. I believe. Um, uh, with uh, Palmer. Yeah, and like uh, Fuzzy uh, Hall on a long bike and stuff. I, that's right, right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's, I think that's, yeah. my, that's like, yeah, I guess it's probably the first movie us, my generation, got to see. Okay, right, right. And Palmer actually just got inducted into the Hall of Fame, him and Rob Warner. Oh, what? Um, when did that just, happen? Yeah, it just happened. And like, they're not inducted, but it's been it, they're, it's like it, a, in writing, they're in, but they're okay. The, the official the, the ceremony event hasn't, hasn't happened yet, or whatever. Because I just the ceremony just hasn't happened yet. a little while ago, and he was in the part like the the wave that went before. So this must be right. the new wave. That's this epic. Is, like it wave. hasn't happened yet, Warner but it's, it's happening. Yeah, it's the same one. Yeah, yeah, oh, totally. Sweet. Okay. So that'll be that'll be awesome. We'll we'll come back to that. Um, so ninety five, I I met Greg Stump, who made these wicked ski movies, and he goes, "Hey, I'm making a mountain bike movie. Do you know any mountain bikers who can do a three sixty? And I'm like, "No, I don't, but I know Richie Slay can do a three three sixty on a BMX." You know, I just saw him do one yesterday. I'm sure he could do one on a mountain bike. And so <laughs> it was like a couple months later and I was working in the woods and I heard a rumor that Christian Beijing, who eventually made the Cranked movies, was coming to town to film Richie Slade do a 360 for this Greg Stump mountain bike movie. And I'm like, he's a BMXer. I got to poach this shoot. And I was in the woods actually on mushrooms with these two girls and we're all taking turns kissing each other. I was kissing these two girls and my ride was leaving and they're like, Tippy, we're leaving in five minutes. If you want to ride to town, let's go. And the movie was being filmed the next day. And I'm like, and I'm kissing these two girls and I'm like, girls, I, I, I gotta go. And they're like, what? No, you can't go. We're going to go back to the tent. We, we, no, no. And I'm like, Oh no, I have to go. And they're like, why would you go anywhere? Like, we're going to, wh where do you have to go? And I'm like, I'm going to be in a mountain bike movie. No way. This is <laughs> Bye, a true girls. story. This is a true Stop. story. So I kissed them both goodbye. And then I ran to the vehicle and I got in the vehicle and I drove to town. Cause we're like, you know, 30, 40 kilometers into the bush. On and um, I got kissing on mushrooms. Girls. And uh, so I get to town and then the next day we go out and we film Richie do the 360 and he stomps it. And then I, sm I smoke a joint with him, and then he went to do it again, but he got off axis, and he ended up face planting, face first into the ground. He didn't, didn't even let go of the handlebars. And as it turns out, the 360 that he stomped was out of focus, and the crash was in focus, so that's all they used for the movie. <laughs> He's hated me ever since. Well, it wasn't your anyway, fault. So, you didn't crash. I know. Well, it well, I, I got him stoned, and he actually threw him off his game for the, for the second 360. 
again anyway again, so then you didn't did right. you have a gun there to his head i don't think so no that's true that's true and so after he did the 360 they're like okay well they wrote a bit of single track and then they're like okay well we need to film something else and i'm like well let's go ride some steeps and they're like what do you mean steeps and i'm like some steep lines and that's, we didn't call free riding free riding back then. We just called it riding steeps. And so I took them to um, where the Callum's Bike Ranch is now. It's by the Valley View Skating Arena. And up from the parking lot are all these steep slopes that go quite aggressive. And myself and Craig Olson, who were into doing that stuff since the 80s, dropped some lines. And they were, like, blown away. Like, they'd never seen anything like it. And we were, like bucking and broncoing down these lines and we had to use specialized bikes because it was sponsored by specialized this movie and so i was on a size small specialized i'm like six feet 220 pounds on this size small bike with like super narrow bars a big long stem and like 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 two inches of travel in the in the in the rock shock forks and i'm bouncing down the slope and like i'm like swapping sideways i'm bouncing this way and i rode it out and I rode the, rode the bike right down to the road, and I hit the ditch, and I bent the forks and the front the wheel right back into the frame, and handed and stepped off the bike and handed it to them, and then they're like filming with a Bolex film camera. Oh my God! Christian says, "Little French Canadian," and he goes, "Okay, you're in the movie." <laughs> so then we took turns on the other. There was two bikes, a red one and a black one. And so we took turns filming on the one bike, dropping steep lines, and that was the first free riding traditional free riding that got into a, a mountain bike movie in 1995 in a movie called Pulp Traction. Um, and then eventually, you know, the next year we did a movie called Dow of Riding, which had some cliff drops that were like, you know, seven, eight feet. And then we did Cranked the year after. And that's the movie that really yeah. broke open free riding to the world when we filmed Cranked. So is there any way to have had other free riding that's not on film? Like, cause I don't, no one else seems to have come forward and said, hang on, I was also dropping off cliffs, right? Like, I'm not saying you weren't, but I'm saying this is the time when there was like barely a person with a camera out in the wilderness. So like, have we heard that's of other, any other communities that were riding steeps? Cause it does seem like it was yes. like this Canadian thing, right? Oh, for sure. Or was there somewhere in California, I know, like in Marin County mountain biking, it started, but had they been thinking of other ways to do it? Have you connected with anyone that's like, yeah, we were doing like some off piece stuff, but it wasn't that big. It wasn't off piece, but I know that the Laguna rats yes. in Laguna, California, were riding some steep stuff. Um, it wasn't off trail because it's a lot rockier down there. Yes, and I've met those guys. You know, amazing there. crew, yeah. Yeah, totally. Like they're hardcore. They're 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 like pretty fit on the climbs, and and they do ride some steep stuff for sure. And they were doing it, I believe, as early as uh, I think they started in 1984. Um, and so I don't know if they were dropping cliffs or not. And I I don't think they were riding off trail because it's not quite the same terrain. You have no, to kind of be on a trail. Dude, you do not want to crash so there. I've tr I've crashed there, like. Yeah, it's chunky and rocky. Yeah, with a and, good and, bike, um, trying to get down some of that stuff. You don't want to crash there. Right, totally. So I know the Laguna Rads were, you know, excuse the word rad, and doing some stuff. Um, I know that uh, there was um, some Frenchman, uh, Fabrice Taifer. His brother Christian Taifer actually won a World Cup downhill, okay. uh, early downhill, like in the early 90s. And his little brother, Fabrice Taifer, was doing some some big drops when we, when we hooked up with them in the 90s and he said he'd been doing it for a while but he never got it on camera so I know he's probably doing some stuff and you know what like there was probably some cowboy a hundred years ago on some prehistoric velocipede before they even called them bicycles trying to get away from from some hostile natives who rode his bike down something that he that his horse wouldn't go down or something to try get with a hot but, girl you never know never know yeah, right. Some some hot cowgirl. <laughs> <laughs> who knows? There's probably people no, just, who've done some gnarly so things. I will never know about. Yeah, but I, it just seems like it was only the Canadians that were that mad that had the terrain like the perfect storm to to sort of start this. Shit yeah, that's this thing, you know. Yeah, like we had the terrain, and we, you know. When, the reason it happened on camera is because we were all, like, I was a professional snowboarder. I rode for Burton. I rode on the Canadian national team. Richie was a pro extreme skier. They call him free skiers. He was like an extreme skier. 
Um, he had, you know, covers of magazines and even some of the big ski movies of the time. Hucking himself, um, very good skier, smooth. Um, and Wade was a, a very successful BMX racer in not pro or anything, but like, um, you know, he's, he has a room full of trophies with like hundreds of trophies and stuff. So he came from BMX. Richie came from uh, skiing, and I came from snowboarding. And you know, I'd, I'd filmed for a bunch of movies. And Richie had been in a bunch of movies skiing. So we kind of like used that momentum and that knowledge to try and make it happen uh, in the mountain bike world, which hadn't happened yet. So, you know, we're at the front of the of the revolution because of our snow experience. Yeah, it makes sense. And maybe some connections with the videographers and surely some of them came over to the sport as well in, in like the lull of the winter and stuff like that, right? Right, exactly. Like Christian Beijing, Bjorn Enga were snow guys. And that's who filmed for uh, the early Cranked. And those guys teamed up to make Cranked 1. Or it was just called Cranked. We didn't know if there would be like eight of them eventually, you know. And then eventually New World Disorder. After Cranked had its reign as the as the cool movie series, then New World Disorder started with Derek Westerlund from Free Ride Entertainment. And then they had their reign as the coolest movies from New World Disorder 1 to 10. Dude, what a, what a trip. And... When did you call yourself a professional mountain biker or get the first contract or paycheck? Like, what did it look like back then? I mean, I understand the scene now pretty well, and I could speak to my yeah. friends about their contracts. Like, what are we talking? Like, are we talking big bucks? Are we talking still sleeping no, on it couches? Like, when were you like, Shit, oh, yeah. dude, we made it. We are bikers now. We're going to focus on this the whole year. <laughs> Snowboarding's just for fun. Like, what are we talking? Well, I had an overlap. Like, I was, I was. I went pro in 91 snowboarding. I went pro in the fall of 97. I was actually still like working in the summers to make sure I had enough money to, to support myself because I, you know, I wasn't rich or anything and I had to, you know, pay rent and buy food and stuff and snowboarding. I was a racer. People who were snowboarding doing freestyle were making big back money, then. hundreds of thousands of yeah. dollars back then. And um, I was a racer, which wasn't as popular as freestyle and, and whatnot. So, I was having to like work still in the summer. Um, and so I was like planting trees forever and I would plant probably about probably a hundred thousand trees a summer to, to make money, like, you know, 15 cents a tree, trying to make my 15 grand or whatever. And then I, I tree planted for nine years. And so I planted over a million trees um, Are you planting in my for career. The government or what? No, for forestry uh, companies, by law, a when private, a company cuts down company. a tree, a private company, when they cut down a tree, they had to plant three yeah. little oh, ones. that's a good system. I don't think our country is that. I've, well, maybe they do have something. Right. That sounds good. Okay. That's what it was back then anyway. So they had to replant, re, re-forest, yeah. you know, uh, BC where they're cutting down trees. And, you know, they've done several generations. Some of those trees that we planted years ago have been cut down again. Anyway, so... I was doing that, and as well, um, I would uh, pave the roads. I would shovel asphalt. And so, you know, I was a chunk of muscle because I was sh- shoveling asphalt all day. And uh, it got me, it kept me in shape, working with a shovel all summer. And then, uh, then I would go snowboarding. But I took my last paycheck from paving in a place called Fern EVC, and I went to this show, this trade show I heard about called Interbike. And it wasn't in Vegas yet. It was in um, uh, California. Uh, where was it in? It, where they have Disneyland. Um, uh, anyways. And I have no idea. A- Anaheim. 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 An- Anaheim. Idea. Yeah, Anaheim, California. And so I went there. Rishi Schley and I both went down. And so this is, for the listener, this there. is the biggest bike trade show at the time. And, well, I don't know. They don't still have it. But anyway, just for context. So you go to this yeah, huge it was, it trade was like show. The, the biggest one in North America, anyways. I don't know if Eurobike was that big yet, but um, we'll just say it was no. the biggest trade show in North America, anyways. And so I went there, and I had like a little VHS tape of myself, and I would like try and get a hold of a VHS machine and show people these this footage of me like jumping off cliffs and riding steep lines, and I had some photos and stuff. And a lot of people weren't into it. They were like, "What do you like?" So is there, is this a competition? And I'm like, no, it's just, we're free riding. And we're like, we're just having fun and we're just doing gnarly things. And they're like, well, how do we, how do we benefit from that? Like who wins? And I'm like, no one wins. You win if you land and you survive. <laughs> you like die. that's how you win. 
if you don't die. And they're like, oh, well, we don't get it. And so not a lot of people got it. And so, and a lot of people were like, well, why would we want you to be seen on camera breaking our products? <laughs> Good point. Like, this doesn't make Good sense point. to us. We don't want anything to do with this. And I'm like, hmm. and so I actually got a few sponsors. Um, Rocky Mountain um, sponsored me and Richie Slay and Wade Simmons and um, a couple of girls, Karis Evans and Damien Skelton, actually. Damien Skelton was a Canadian national downhill champion and Karis was this crazy chick who rode gnarly lines. But I think they only did one or two years. But the three of us, the the guys, we you know rode for years under the banner of the Rocky Mountain Pro Riders. And Marizoki, uh, Bryson Martin saw what was going on, and he's like, "This is cool. I like this. This is going to yeah, be a cool win." They backed it from early on. Her that brand, I remember that. Totally. Yeah. The Z1 was like an open bath design, and it was like low maintenance, pretty like heavy for the day, like compared to what else whatever else was on, on the, on the, uh, market. And, uh, I think Jiro helmets stepped in and anyway, so I walked out of there with like, you know, like 20 and a 12 and a $10,000 contract. So I walked out of there with enough money that I didn't have to do a normal job anymore. And I could just ride my bike and, and snowboard in the winter. And, um, it was amazing for, for me, that was big money. And, um, you know, it climbed over the years. And at one point, you know, I think in the 2000s when I did Rampage, I was doing like six figures. But early, like to, to make, you know, 40, 50 grand was insane. Like that was like for a small redneck kid, I was like buying a new truck. I bought a dirt bike. I'm all, like, I could like take my friends out for dinner and like, I, I was like, I was like ghetto rich. <laughs> um, and the thing is I didn't have to work so I could just ride all the time. And, um, you know, so then we, and it was, everything was free, you know, everything w were sponsored. And so we'd get free plane tickets and, and all the gear was free. And then, you know, we start traveling the world, trying to spread the word, the gospel of free ride. And, um, as, as the sport grew and people got more and more into it, people would take us to their gnarliest trails and try and kill us to see if we could ride these technical things. And that's exactly what we wanted because we wanted a challenge and we're trying to, you know, get good photos and, and, and get a rush from see if we could hang on down these gnarly slopes that people would take us to. And it, it was just an amazing time in the golden age of free ride. And, you know, like, I did a 15 footer and then dangerous Dan did an 18 footer. And then I did a 22 footer and then, you know, dangerous Dan did 23 footer. Then I did a 25 footer and then Bender came along and then Bender did a 32 footer and then Wade did a, you know, 35 footer. And like, it was just all this like one upsmanship and, and the sport was growing and, and everyone's going bigger and bigger. And, um, it was just a magical time. And uh, it was all so fresh and new, and we were rock stars. And talking about pretty, kissing pretty girls, it was like being a rock star. Like in Europe, you know what it's like in Europe. If you're like a professional cyclist or professional soccer player, it's like being a rock star. And so there was tons of beautiful ladies, and it, it was a dream come true. I was just like surrounded just by all these babes going, I love this. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, how many years, how yeah. many years would you like, how many years did that last? Like the heydays of this new generation of free ride sponsors, magazines, like getting so, invited around, yeah. like, you know, what, what? for me, it was like 97 till, um, 97 until 2001, I rode for Rocky and then Rocky dropped me. And then I rode for specialized 2002, 2003, 2004. And so I would say from 97 to 2004 were the golden ages, golden age of free ride for me. Um, I think it went on a little bit further for some, from other athletes, but you know, I actually lost the plot a bit and I went down the tubes because, um, I love to party and I love people and you know what it's like yeah. when you meet fans and, like, and it's like, like a vibe, like, come have a beer with us. Yeah. It's hard when yeah. everyone's so like stoked, you know, and it, like the energy is good, right? Yeah. It's totally yeah. good, and people are are pleased, stoked to meet you, and and I was stoked to meet people from different places, and 
I didn't want to, I didn't want to ever let people down. If someone said, Hey, come have a beer with us. I was like, yeah, okay. And then I'd sit down with some strangers and drink beer with them. And, um, I didn't want to like, you know that saying, you, you never, you should never meet your heroes because you don't want to be let down. Yeah. I wanted to be that guy where people were always stoked to meet. Yeah. I wanted to like be approachable. I wanted to be like, have a beer with everyone who wanted to have a beer with me. And I was good at partying, <laughs> I was you know? Good and so <laughs> I could sprint, I could drink fast. I could drink for a long time. And, uh, I never really did drugs. I was mostly just a drinker, you know, I'd smoke the odd doobie, but, um, I, I never really did drugs. So I was just like, you know, a, a, a sociable beer drinker and, and tequila shooters or whatever it was. Right. Um, and so I just tried to be, uh, as fun as I could. And then, um, eventually then it kind of got the end of me. It got the best of me when I eventually, you know, tried drugs and, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't a good thing. Cause I, like, imagine me on, on hard drugs. Like I'm pretty excitable as it is, and so to to hit it like that was um, quite quite gnarly. And um, I didn't sleep very much, and I kind of like started not rotting as much, and uh, it wasn't good. Uh, so I kind of went down the tubes and at the end of 2004, I had fully lost the plot and, uh, I was like, basically became someone else for, for a number of years. And, uh, it was, uh, in 2007, I got it together and I went to rehab and, uh, Derek Wessler, who made the new world of Sorter movies, um, used to be a student of my dad's. And he, I wanted to get out of, of Kamloops where I was doing bad things for a long time. And he chaperoned me to go to Crankworks. And so I went to Crankworks and um, I, I actually kept it together. Jordy Lund was a friend of mine and he looked after me too. He made sure I didn't do anything stupid and do any, any drugs or anything like that. And while I was there, I met a girl that ended up saving my life and she was a mountain biker from the old days in the deep cove days, which was like the Marin County of Canada where the first mountain bikes uh, were brought into Canada. And this girl lived down the street from the store and she saw the first mountain bikes roll off the truck into the store. And um, she had worked in the movie industry for nine years in London. And she came back and saw full suspensions and was like, I like this. And she got right into mountain biking. And then we met here she is there. She's Amazing. got back from the gym. This is great. Hi, you're Cameo home. Cameo appearance. Right. That was, so that's my wife, Sarah. How eerie was that timing? Right. She just got home from the and gym. You just said the most loving thing ever. She yeah. Will, uh, well, she... I'll send her the snippet. I will we'll earmark this right. one. Be like, see? Right. <laughs> anyway, so my wife's home. Um, she just went to the gym this morning. So... This girl saved my life. Like, basically, I met her, and I saw her at the Longhorn, and I was like, oh, my God, that's the most beautiful girl I've ever seen in my life. And I was looking at her, and she had, like, little pipes, you know? She was, like, like fit. And I, I was like, okay, she's beautiful. She, she can't have a killer body, too. And I saw this fit, cycling, trim body with, like, toned calves and, like, nice legs. And I was like my God, she had this little vest on and these little toned pipes, you know? And uh, I was like, I have to meet her. I have to meet her. So she was talking to my buddy, Wade Simmons. So I cruise over and I'm like, hey, Wade, how's it going? And I'm like, and who's this? And she's like, and who are you? And we started talking and we hit it off. I cracked a joke and she took my joke and she converted it and batted it back over the net. And I'm like, Oh my God. So I took the joke, I converted it, I bat it back to over the net again. She took it, converted it back to back. We had this tennis game of wordplay. And I'm like, oh my God, she's super smart and quick and funny. <laughs> and oh, thank you. Thank and you. And gives you which, healthy smoothies. Yeah, and healthy smoothies. So you're like, which one is this? We just become best friends. <laughs> and love is the same. And so, <laughs> come here, come here. Here's needles. I'm on the needles, <laughs> moving the needle podcast. 
I, I digress to tell you that I just bought him an energizer. He does not. Oh, you're watching. He does not need watch any out. energizing on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. It's gonna get crazy so, here. He's all juiced up. Now this, we all juiced this up. This I haven't done. I'll just before. tell him how we hang met. Hang on, hang on. I've got his uh, chain of events of meeting you for the first time when you were with Wade Simmons, apparently Longhorn. What did you think of Tippy? Yeah. That f- I've known Wade from yeah, but what did you 90s, think of right? Tippy the so first I'm time excited. he came over? Well, it was so I missed the whole free ride. I I've been a mountain biker in the you know eighties and nineties, and then I moved to the UK and I you know was living big city dreams and stuff, and I never I missed the whole free ride thing completely. So I came back and I kind of got in with my back in with my Cove crew, and then we were up at Crankworks and like I was so I was talking to Wade, and we were outside on the Longhorn at Whistler, which is a big outside bar during crank work so it was crazy and you know outdoor patio lights and I remember he this face just floating across the crowd this massive head and he actually it was like a lunar eclipse he blocked out the patio light and all I could see was this big smile yeah. like looking at me and he's like hi and who's this and I'm like well never mind it, like who I am who the heck are you right <laughs> and uh, kind of just literally it was like from day the moment that we met it was just kind of on that's so amazing to hear. <laughs> and and that way ever since. Shucks. I got to say, though, we, we, I, I, I asked her out, and we went for our first date in the Whistler Bike Park. Yeah. And I had been doing, like, a lot of bad things for a number of times. I hadn't ridden my bike for, like, yeah. basically for four or five years, yeah. four years. And she'd been riding a lot. Like, but I hear you're a professional mountain biker, so let's go mountain biking. And, like, and so yeah, she I schooled me. try do that again. Right, yeah. So we went riding. It was a little bit wet. It was slippery. No excuses. What it was? It was wet for me too. I know, I, mean, I know. Like, but anyway, I was so wet and slippery, like it was a bad. She thing. schooled me. Like I ended up crashing on this little wall ride on Crank It Up, and she hit the wall ride and did a little turn down off the wall and hit the next wall and aired off the wall and it was gone. And I'm like, I crash. I rolled my knee pad off. I'm like, ah! So I jump back on my bike and I'm racing after, and I hit the next little wooden feature and I grease out. And I go off the thing and I nut myself like on my seat. I'm like, ah! Oh! And I'm like, and so I race down the trail and she's like waiting way down the trail. It's a trail, right? Like it's not. I know, right? So I get down there and like she's got her hands like just neatly pursed on her lap, you know, and I come up sweating, bleeding. And she's like, I thought you used to be a pro. <laughs> and I go, I used to be Red Tippy. <laughs> And so she got stickers eventually made by Marizoki that said, I used to be Red Tippy, and they sold out. <laughs> That's correct. I still see them around town on like bumpers and stuff every once in a while. So we had a second date the next weekend, and I went and rode every day that week just to get back on the bike and try and get, get my mojo back. And so we went and rode the North Shore, and we went and rode uh, CBC, yeah. Black Diamond, <laughs> and she schooled me again. Like super gnarly, chunky, rock, <laughs> greasy, and... And I was just looking at the things you don't want to, like I hadn't ridden for a while. So I was looking at what I didn't want to hit. And then I would go off trail and then get that back. Trail on the trail has no flow. Like you have to, it's super know chunky where you're going to go on that. But she schooled me again. And I was in love. I'm like, that's amazing. Who is this girl? And the rest is history. And so and I've never schooled him since. <laughs> and then I got my mojo back and then, uh, you know, we got and it back. So paid the spirits so, back clearly. Right. But I had lost every single sponsor, and I was doing construction. You worked as an instructor at the Vancouver Film School after working in the movie industry for nine years. Yeah. And then, um, you know, after a couple of years of doing construction, we had a baby coming all of a sudden um, the next year. And um, after a couple of years of doing construction, I got laid off. And I was like, oh, my God, I have to pay rent. I have to buy diapers. I have to buy food. Like, Well, and I was on maternity leave. And in Canada, you have a whole year, which is amazing yeah. to be with your baby. So I was like – you know, I'm here, I'm with our baby, why don't you, and you've been laid off, so you have, um, you have um, unemployment insurance, so we had a little bit of money coming in, not a lot, by any means, we were pretty broke, but I was like, you know, why don't you take this time to go and shoot and reconnect with the mountain biking industry on a more professional level, right, and just go and have fun, like, ride your bike, here's your chance, go. And I was hungry, the new Brett TV, this is like, you know, Brett TV 2.0, and so I was hungry to make up for, you know, four or five years of bad choices and, and having disappeared. And, and so I was like riding every steep, gnarly line I could find. I was hitting like, I'm not much of a jumper, typically known as a jumper, but I was hitting like the Squamish River Gap and like some big jumps that like, like Chandra, Andrew Chandra wouldn't hit it. They it was custom made this one jump for the collective. He wouldn't hit it. So I went like, I'll hit it. Oh, it's all coming out now. Yeah. And, uh, you know, 
<laughs> like uh, Matt Hunter hit it and uh, Thomas Vanderham and me. And um, so I hit that and a bunch of other gnarly lines that, you know, I was trying to claw my way back to the industry and I was doing it trying to like, you know, prove that I still had something to offer. And by this time you're, you know, almost 40. I'm almost been 40. Away That's for a my while, age now. I am not like trying to jump going. shit at all that someone else doesn't want to right. jump. So yeah, that must be tough at <laughs> right, that yeah. age though, is what I mean. Like there comes a time. Yeah. Where you well, don't he feel was like at that, that point. No, exactly. But he was hungry for getting back into the industry and the, you know, getting, maybe getting on board with some sponsors again. And, you know, this is kind of all he knew how to do. So he just was doing it, but you know, it was a, it definitely clawing his way back. It wasn't easy. It didn't, it took, handful of years and it took a lot of doors closing on him honestly like a lot of events for free a lot of offering to do i said yes to every single job do. it's one of those small things, medium right? large i said yes to everything and if i had to work for free i'd work for free this, i just gained experience that. and i i just i worked around the clock i would drive to different mountains then drive overnight to be at the, another event the next day or a photo shoot or whatnot like i literally worked around the clock and her with her smarts coming from the movie industry and <laughs> And she's got like a semi-photographic memory, something like like a super brain. Sounds like going a female. On. They have memories of elephants, from what I can tell, in the right. most complimentary right? way <laughs> ever. Right, like I, we go through a drive-through, and like um, the guy will be like, "Hey, are you Brett Tippy?" I'm like, "Yeah, how's it going, man?" And she'll look at him, and she'll be like, "Jason Forsythe," and she'll say his oh. name, and he's looking for a name badge, going, "How do you know that?" And she's like, Four Instagram. years ago, you came up and introduced yourself oh, to wow. Brett, and I remembered. So she, she just remembers things. I do. And so working together, and we strategically um, picked the right events to, to, to hit that we could, basically everything we could. You worked so hard that you, and you were just constantly knocking on the door so much that eventually people had to take notice and they couldn't say no yeah. when you just dropped your big, because back then you used to have a portfolio of pages. Of yeah, yeah. I have a portfolio. Dude, I used to do that. You did the, did the do? video at Interbank. Right? I did the... I did the CV, the yeah. race CV, you know, make sure right. you look totally. So, you know, as soon totally. as he likes, you know, just drop that on the desk in the boardroom at whoever he was trying to woo. woo. I mean, it was undeniable. They couldn't deny it, even though a lot of them did actually try because they were, you know, like concerned that at that point, maybe he was a bit of a liability or that, you know, whatever. But what they also, a lot of them didn't take on board that with the dawn of, you know, the digital age and social media and pink bike and videos and people were you know we we had a, and brett's little black book of knowing everybody and having access to everybody it was like a it was a gold mine of i was made for social genius. media yeah, i mean for sure, dude. it was perfect timing it was kismet yeah yeah and so all of a sudden i was getting millions of views and i was getting more than my teammates and i'm like you know like i need to get paid and so they started paying and so all of a sudden i had sponsors and then i had you know like maxis came aboard maxis sponsored me and maloya clothing and then night um, rider uh night rider uh sr sun tour uh, yeah, and awesome. envy wheels um basically just you know got me back in the in the game as a pro mountain biker but i also started doing a lot of announcing and i was asked um Stu mckay smith who did the covers for the cranked movies hooked me up with Whisker, Whistler Creek Productions, who were making the Crankworks daily reports back then. And so I started doing the Crankworks daily yeah, reports. Yeah, I remember those. And, yeah. um, they were pretty grassroots back then. Pretty, yeah, grassroots. pretty unpolished. It was a grassroots series back then. You get then away with well, a lot yeah. more on there then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. No one else was doing anything. <laughs> it, was, it was a rogue cowboy. We'll get ourselves canceled these days for sure. Yeah. Oh, for sure, it'd be canceled. <laughs> I'm gonna leave you guys and have my that lunch. Was, enjoy the rest that, of the thanks podcast. Thanks for joining thanks us. Thanks for letting me no, that, intercept. No, well, that was good that timing. Was how most, you just came in the door. That was the most like his story and how, back into mountain biking. But you, that's so serendipitous. I think it's it was so fitting. <laughs> thanks for saving my life. Yeah, uh, and saving my career. Yeah, amazing. Wow. I love, you. love you too. Bye. That was so special. I, I'm 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 wow. I'm so thankful. Dude, that was the she just craziest walked in the door. shit I've experienced. The timing's the unreal. Hey, you said it wow. earlier. It's all about timing. How did you plan that? It's all about you timing. You text and you're like, by the way, know. at uh, 55 minutes in, I'm going <laughs> to give you the the cue to come in here. Right. Yeah, that was, it was, it was unbelievable timing in my life to, to meet that woman. Um, 
you know, she she's super organized and she's super fun. Like she was a punk rock chick, and and she she doesn't take any shit. So I I could not. And once we had a baby, I couldn't ruin someone else's life. I, I'd ruined my life for a bit, and I was just like, so she wasn't gonna take I don't any wanna... bullshit, right? She was like, right, I like can see through. she gave me three strikes. Okay. Oh yeah, for sure. Like, I, 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 she gave me three strikes, and um, and then she was like, "Okay, that's it." And I went, "Listen, you know, when, whenever, whenever I do these drugs, it's because I end up getting drunk and I'm wasted. I make bad choices when I'm wasted, and I, I, I I'm not an alcoholic, but sometimes I, I would drink just, to excess, and I would did like. I just hear in the background chirpy. She's like, yeah, you're, totally. you're sugarcoating it. Like that's, I can, I can, th- so she called me out. She, she called my bullshit. I have to thank you for and sharing. And we work together as a I good team. I have to thank you for sharing that because I could, I could hear that your, the, the, the volume of your voice as well as the tone changing. It's still a tough thing for you to speak about. Right. And I didn't want to. Well, it's embarrassing. I, I, it's an embarrassing time. I like I was always an athlete needles, you know, like I don't look at it I was, I was a world cup snowboard cup yeah, racer. But for you to sh- I was a pro nah. mountain biker. I had a, a mountain guy. I don't. And then to, to do what I did is like, so nah, dude. it's such a nightmare. For you to speak about like, that like, is not embarrassing. Like that to me takes courage to share like someone that has been successful, that still has tough times, but they can dig yourself out of those times. Well, and get yourself back on the map. Who knows? Better than you might have been because you were like, were so low. For you to dig yourself yeah. out and have sponsors to be able to share the story. Like I am so grateful that you do that because I think there's yeah, there, there might be people listening to this that are going through your dark times but don't know how to dig themselves out or if it's even worth it. Like you're a dude. I love hanging out with you. Like you're infectious. And to know that you had some tough times, dude. Thanks for sharing that. And and I don't think we have to yeah. dig too deep. And I don't want to. Yeah. Uh, well, it's cool. It's cool. And you know what? Like, if I can inspire someone else to to step towards the light, oh, like I, that's why I'll share my story. Like, I'm not proud of it. I don't want people to really know. But at the same time, there might be someone out there who is right exactly where I was, who is actually a very gifted, passionate mountain biker who's lost their way and. To know that someone else has done it might give them strength. And I, and I get messages on Instagram and stuff from people going, dude, I'm six years sober or I'm three months sober or I'm one year sober. Thank you for, you know, showing me the way or give me some tips that one time on Instagram and stuff. And I think, you know, the, the, the fact that I've walked the, that dark path and, and clawed my way out of it can show others that it's possible. And if even just one is inspired then then it's worth it you know so yeah dude, um, so much so just just hearing it a bit i wonder if it was kind of the masking of that career you thought might be ending you said you were riding less but you were causing a bit of trouble going on this dark patch do you think some of it was maybe the like the young guns were coming up and the career was ending because that is a big thing for athletes when their career ends and like what to focus on and how good it was like cool. these careers are always going to end whether it ended at that year or two years later or when sponsors were like, we're moving on to the next young kid or with me with racing it was like, well, it's not quite the results we need or, you know, your contract's up and, and part of me was going to walk away, but I dig into this quite a lot and, and, it, and it's a fascinating topic. Like it's a death, it's a, it's a form of death retiring or being forced out of a career, right? Yeah. It's the death of, of your athletic career. Yeah. Um, it, at some point it happens to everyone. Like, no matter how fast you are, you can't be fast or, or go the biggest forever because that's just the way the world works. There's new talent coming up. And, you know, um, I think I think that's like my dad used to say, the wheels of the living roll over the bones of the dead, which is kind of like graphic about life, you know, but it's also the way of, of like a little death of people's careers. The wheels of the living roll over the bones of, of people's dead careers. Like you have a certain window. And when that window's done, if you don't have something else to transition to, you're you're not as valuable to the people who are acting to pay you money and give life to that career. And so, you know, like you have to transition to coaching, guiding, um, live announcing, video hosting, podcasts, or whatever to provide value and and to keep yourself relevant. Because um, just being a writer forever is not viable, no matter who you are. 
Yeah, hundred percent. It's not going to be viable for Greg forever. You know, he's going to transition whether it's next year, the year after, into ambassadorship. You're right. Lopes, Lopes is not riding at the level. It's just like it's a really tough thing to have that ceiling on a, on a career. As whereas if you go some other normal paths, you have a longer career. It's uh, it's right, just it's true. obviously it comes up on the podcast at nauseum. So it's you know it's just just to me it's such a fascinating topic. You know. Yeah, it's um, like uh, my dad said, uh, I think it was it Shakespeare that said fame, thy bubble. Fame what? Thy bubble. I, yeah, I, that was my least favorite subject at school. You have to explain that one to me. But like the so bubble, fame like the bubble is a, little it, pop. Fame is a little bubble. Pop. Little pop. Yeah. And it's gone, thy bubble. right? It's, it's like 100%. It's temporary. Thy, thy bubble, you know? So um it's like it that's poignant that's that's super real and um you know i'm i'm in a position where i'm lucky enough that i was one of the first in, in free ride so i have that name and notoriety and it was in those early movies and back then there was only one or two movies a year there's like a cranked movie which is the big one and so people watched it that tape over and over and over and over and you know it's kind of like being in the rat pack you know of the hollywood days they know those original stars and then once the, the the new age moved on with like, you know, you get 10 videos a day on pink bike or whatever. It's just so saturated with so many talented riders in beautiful places that it goes in and out of your head. But for my day, like there was only one big movie a year. So that has kept me um, in people's minds because I was there in the original, in the original days. And as well as a lot of the on camera stuff that we do, you're still out there, but you're doing it in a different capacity and, and dealing with the sport. Not so much just your own writing. Yeah, it's fascinating how it's changed. You just mentioned like there's 10 a day of some most incredible writing you've ever seen. And I I can't even keep up with it. Literally, I cannot keep up with it. And that doesn't mean it's bad. It's just, just such a change just, of the It's times, hard to keep right? up. I remember that. Sven coming to South Africa and bringing me these tapes and we'd wear them out and Vores would be there doing a bar spin and I'd see it on a videotape, be like, okay, so it's doable. So take the break off, figure it out and, and do it. And now you can just go on YouTube at any time of the day and, and find something new or something to inspire you, hey? Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's uh it's like an, uh, it's like a river of content now of of talented people and people are going to tap in to see exactly what they want. And like, even the websites are having a challenge because people are going to their favorite writers on Instagram to follow exactly who and what they want to follow. And it's just like, things will always change and who knows what's next, you know, but, um, the only thing constant is change. They say, 100%, so, right? you know, it's always different and it's like, uh, it's tough to keep your finger on the pulse to know who and what it's going to be, but it's going to be different because that's, that's what it is. Like Instagram seems to be the big thing right now. And your Instagram numbers can determine a big part of what your salary is. And, um, you know, what, what, like what's going to be next? Like what's, what's the TikTok and the, all these things that the kids are you on, are you like, on what's, TikTok? What's my daughter do? Are you on TikTok? My daughter is, my daughter tried to get me on it and she actually made me an account, but I never do it. I don't want to be on my phone I all know, day. Like, I, I, I want to go ride my bike. So t- I want to go. I don't want to be on my phone I all day. No, it's so tough to pick up another thing like that. Speaking of your daughter, but she's racing, right? My daughter's a racer. Yeah, like a little bit, um, a recreational racer. Because I, I announce all the Canada Cups, and so I hit all the downhills and all the BC Cups, and so she comes to all the races. She's been with us for years, and it's kind of like, um, you know, I can go hit the road for, for the summer and this is my family or they can come with me. So they come with me and um, they get me a hotel for the event. So I have my family stay with me. And so she started racing last year Yeah. and um, she also started filming. And so she actually, she had an explosion. Like she's always been riding. I've had her riding since she was three on the North shore in the rain at night. And uh, she's also a ski racer. So she goes really fast on her ski. She's more into skiing than mountain biking, but she mountain bikes because I make her. <laughs> no, no, she loves it. I'm just kidding. She loves it. But she's just very casual about it. But um, 
she's actually gotten quite good because like she's ridden since she was three and I've had her on a full suspension, like a little, um, where was she on a little shredder and then a spawn and then now a YT, um, cause I'm sponsored by YT. So she gets uh, one of Sarah's old downhill bikes. And so she wrote some lines last year that scared the hell out of me because they were quite steep. Like she wrote some of my old steep lines. She wrote some old like Maddie Hunter lines, some Graham Agassiz lines. And she's like, like, I'm like, oh, I don't know if you're, she goes, I got this dad. And I'm like, but it's super like, she goes, I got it. And I'm like, are you sure you don't have to do this for me? You don't have to do this for the camera. Like this dad, I got this. And I'm like, okay, okay. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so she wrote a line for the new, uh, like the guys who made the new world disorder movies, they're doing a movie called nothing's for free. And she's in it. And she wrote a gnarly line a couple of times. Um, that, I don't know, it scared me. Like I got, had her in a, in a little Liat neck brace, a nice Liat 8.0 downhill helmet. So I knew she was safe. She had good armor on and stuff, but you, you got to check the movie. How she wrote this are you line. dealing with this? Cause that's one of the questions I spoke to a buddy and I was like, Tippy's coming to the podcast. And I was like, and he's like not a core old school mountain biker, but he's a mountain biker. So I was like, Tippy, he's like, dude, yeah, yeah, crazy. And he was like, the one thing was energy. Where does he get the energy? I was like, we'll, we'll get onto that. And then he's like, oh, but ask him how, because he has kids. He's like, how is he dealing with his daughter that's riding and racing? And how, right. I mean, you're telling me that it's nerve wracking, but how are you actually dealing with it? Well, when I watched her drop into a steep line last year, I was sitting there and she said she had it and I wrote it for her and I got to the bottom. I'm like, okay, that's like super gnarly. Like yeah. it's like probably like 60 degrees at the top for like 25 feet. And then it, there's a couple windy turns and there's a rut. And then I was like, I wrote it and I stopped. And I'm like, okay, that's too gnarly. Like she's never done anything like that. And then I was going to stop it. I'm like, okay, that's enough. If my wife saw what was going on here right now, she would kill me. And I did, before I had a time to get off my bike and go, okay, no, 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 no. I hear a three, two, one. And she counts down and I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And the camera's rolling and I'm like, and she rolls down this ridge line and she turns into the steep line and then just let's go. And I told her actually, when, when I was trying to, to coach her on it, I go, you're going to break traction and you're going to start going really fast. Like you have to, you have to be okay with going really fast for a while. She's like, well, how fast am I going to go? And I'm like, probably about maybe not even half as fast as you've been on your skis, but it's going to be seen way faster because you're on a mountain bike. And she's like, oh, okay, fine then. And I'm like, are you sure? She's like, yeah, yeah. So she went into this pitch and she started breaking traction and she let go of the brakes enough that she didn't skid, you know, and she's bouncing and skipping down this thing. And then she hit like, like, like a slightly less transition where it wasn't quite as steep. And she started anchoring the back brake a little bit. Then she got on the front brake. She reeled it in, anchored her down, stopped, got off the bike. And she's like, <laughs> and I'm like, Oh my God. And like, I had pulled my hamstring doing backflips into the airbag at the Casey Brown free ride camp. And he's like, give me do a backflip. I'm like, okay, it's an airbag. So I was throwing backflips. I pulled my hamstring. So I'm running down to her with like one leg and I'm like hugging her. I was so, um, distraught, like relieved. I actually started crying. <laughs> I was like, this is my baby. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like she's 13 years old. She just wrote a, like a life threatening line. If she went over the bar, she's going to fly 25, 30 feet. And whether you have a neck brace or not, I don't know. It wasn't going to be good. And she wrote it. And I was like, oh. and I actually started crying. And she called me on it. She's like, are you crying, Dad? And I'm like, Jeez. you're like, if you <laughs> only knew. <laughs> right. And so so she did a whole bunch of um, did a bunch of lines that were super gnarly. And then she actually got a, a big wake-up call the when we were I saw at. The um, Is it on your Instagram, that one? It's on yeah, Instagram. You see horrible. that one? Yeah. Horrible. That's like, so that's a, in a shoot called, um, it's on a trail called Rock Hammer. It's the gnarliest double black diamond at Big White Bike Park. And that's the gnarliest shoot. Ooh. And she wanted to do the left side of it because it was, it was, didn't have as many rocks. It was steeper. But I was like, ah, I don't know. That's like probably the gnarliest line here. Why don't you try this one and, and then, then take it from there. And so she goes, okay. So she went up to go get her bike and I thought she was going to come down to me or I was going to coach her and say, get to the left side of the chute because there's a bunch of chunky rocks in the middle to the right. You want to be the left side of the chute. 
And she just grabbed her bike and rode down from where she was and just rode right into it, like no hesitation. And I'm like, and she hit the rock to the front wheel, went over the bars, flew 15 feet into the rocks, bent her wrist all the way back, smashed her helmet, smashed her body. And she was winded. And I ran up to her and she just laid on the ground going, ah! Ah! and I'm like, oh no. Like, <clears throat> like, is she, did she hurt her back or neck or did she break a bone? Like, what's wrong with her? Sounds like she's just winded. I hope she's just winded. You know, and then after about a minute of, ah, ah, she goes, ah, ooh. you know what the first thing she said was? She says, ha, 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 I hope you got that on camera, Dad. Oh yeah. <laughs> Two peas in a pod there. Oh, my God. Uh, Anyways, I was so relieved. And so then what, we took her down to the patrol and they're like, okay, like they looked at the crash and they're like, okay, this is serious. Like. She's going to need surgery on her, her arm. Like, this is going to be bad. Are you ready for this, sir? And I'm like, I, 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 uh, yeah, I'll take her there right now. So I took her to the hospital. They x-rayed her. And they and I heard them through the sheet going, okay, are you sure this is the right person? Jessamy Tippy, Tippy, T-I-P-P-I-E. And they're like, yes, it's the right person. Another x-ray. I don't believe you. So they got an x-ray again. They came back again. And they went, are you sure this can't be right? And they're like, yes, CAT scan. Send her for a CAT scan. And then finally they went, okay, we don't understand, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with your daughter. <laughs> Except that she's crazy like her father. Yeah. And I said, I go, she's made of tippitanium. <laughs> <laughs> Tipanium. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Anyways, we, we got really lucky. Um, she got lucky. Um, she had good Liat downhill helmet that saved her from a concussion. She had a neck brace. A let neck brace and like a chest protector. Like she had all the stuff. And then she actually took a week of riding off, week and a half. And then she got three days of riding in and she went, it was time for the Canadian National Downhill Championships at Kicking Horse, which is a super long run. It's like the gondola is 4,000 feet. The race course is half of that. It's only 2,000 feet, but it's super chunky and rocky. And she got fourth place in the Canadian Nationals after that big crash. And uh, and she she had a crash mid run, blew her shoe off, put her shoe back on. She was in third, <laughs> just behind second, and she put her shoe back on and then and reeled back into fourth. And so, yeah, like uh, it, she's just a little animal. And then she got third at the uh, Air Downhill at the Crankwork Summer Series. Um, and so, yeah, I know I'm proud father. I know, I know, I am proud. As you should be. That's and. Cool. Uh, yeah, so she's fun to ride with. Like she's she's a fast little ripper. Um, she just got seventh in the in the ski racing in the BC zones, um, and she's racing um, grade eight to twelve. She's only grade nine. She's racing grade elevens and twelve. She got seventh in the zones, so she's fast. That's amazing. And uh, she's just like super casual about it, and just like you can take it or leave it. And she's just like playing her music while she's like ready to drop into a run. She doesn't get like that stage fright or, or that she just lays down the hammer when it's time to lay down the hammer and uh, doesn't really seem to care. She's just like, eh, that was, that was fun. That's so <laughs> great. Could you think like, would you have ever predicted this? Like back when you were free riding or causing trouble in Europe or even the dark times, like no. look at where you are now, you no. know, with your family and, and back in the, back totally. in, the, in the industry, you know? Yeah, totally. And then my other daughter is 11 and um, she's on the spectrum a little bit. She's, she's um, a little bit autistic. And so she's not like as fast as Jessamy. But I got to say that we don't care about that. She, <laughs> she has never, ever, once, ever said no to a ride. Loves she it, loves really? to ride. That's so cool. She, like, needles. Not once has she ever just ever said no to a ride. Like, raining snowing hot and like hot like day night it doesn't matter and skiing too she she has always said yes 100 percent to going shredding every single time she you loves can learn, it you can learn a lot from that don't you think <laughs> yeah and then and then she gets mad when the ride's over like i'm like <laughs> okay we've gone like like kilometers and yeah, kilometers like, and kilometers yeah, it's got a race now like, like we're gonna stop now yeah 
she's into it. And so her passion is actually amazing. And, you know, to, to, to ride with my wife and to ride with my kids is an absolute dream come true. And they're my favorite people to ride with. Like I get to ride with like the best riders in the world. Like, like I've ridden, you know, with like people who would, people would dream to ride with Cam Zink and, and, you know, Wade Simmons and, and Brog Vestovic and, and like, all the best riders in the world, you know, as you do as well. And you, at one point you were one of the very best in the world, but you know, all our friends are the best in the world. So, you know, like, like to, to, to have my favorite people to ride with is my family. It's such a cool and wild thing that I feel very, very blessed. And, um, it's just the coolest thing ever. Yeah, I can, I can see that. It's like it gave you a career and then it sort of brought you back to, to life, if you will, for lack of a better term, you know? I think that's super Holy. special. Like mountain bikes gave you yeah. what you got as well as saved you, you know? It's yeah, quite totally. Full, it's quite uh, full circle for you. It's very full for, circle. For, uh, you know, yeah, it's pun like... Intended, pun intended. Yeah, the right. Wheel, the <laughs> wheel of intended. life. The wheel of life, man. It's amazing. It's, uh, you know, having kids, like I, I, I thought at first, like, oh my God, I'm not going to be able to shred as much. I'm, like, I'm, I'm down for this. I'm going to be a good dad. But it turned out to be that shredding with them is better than anything I've ever done. And, you know, I've shredded a lot. I've, I've been to 40 different countries. I've shredded the best single track and some of the wildest, coolest free, line, free ride lines that were in the movies for years and years. But to go for a ride with my family is, um, is something that's more special than I ever thought and more powerful and God, I just feel so That's lucky. wicked. It's, it's so cool. I heard a saying that uh, they say when you have kids and you're not living through them, but he said you live again, meaning like if you drop them at school for the first time, then you sometimes remember your first day or maybe this riding right. starts bringing that energy back of like your, f and like why you fell in love with riding, right? Because your kids are just pumped, right? You're saying your daughter just says yes to every ride. When you get older, you get yes. a bit complacent or you've ridden with all the best rides in the world. You're like, okay, well, I'll ride tomorrow. It's raining today. Uh, would would right, you right. say that's the case with kids, like living your life again in a weird way? You live your life again because you get to experience all those things again that remind you of when you went through it for your first time. And it's just all those little details of, of like, you know, things that you forget, like, like, oh, I, I'm catching my pedal on this route, Dad. Well, let's do a little backspin. Like, let's do a little backspin, and your pedals will be level. Oh, yeah, okay, okay, okay. And the, the little, those little small little discoveries that they make, and you rediscover, like, oh, yeah, like, I remember learning that. And, and just all the little details bring you back in time to when you were at that stage. And so it's like, it's like a little time travel, and um, you relive your life through them as they're – exploring it for the first time and what's the i mean we all know having kids and marriage is not easy right it's beautiful but it's not easy are you what, what's the hardest thing for you of, the of hardest thing kids. for me of having a kids? discovery part as you can hear oh well i just you know it's the, the it's it's nerve-wracking when you don't when you can't like protect them like in your arms, you have them in your arms. And then as they grow up and they get out into the world, like my, my youngest one's out riding and you know, if she hits a bump and goes off the trail and skins her knee and then you're not in control, that's kind of a little bit scary. My oldest one is 14 and she's taking the bus downtown with her friends to go to, you know, um, shopping or just stores or to a concert or whatever. And you're not there to, to guard them. And all my life I've been guarding them like to the world and all the dangers of the world. And all of a sudden, you have to let them fly, whether it's just like down the street on a bike or, or in life. And that's scary, you know, like, like my daughter, you know, there were some kids asking her at school, um, you know, saying, what part is this bike on your bike? What, what part is that? And she's like, I don't know. I don't know. And she, they're like, you're a poser. You don't know what even parts you have on your bike. She goes, Whatever. I don't need to know what parts I have to ride my bike. I went to the Worcester Bike Park last weekend. What'd you do? And they're like, ah. Uh. <laughs> and, then, and then my oldest daughter, she's walking down the hall at school with her on her phone between classes. The biggest kid in grade 10 walks by and grabs her phone out of her hand and walks away with her phone. And she's like, 
Like, I go, what did you do? She goes, <laughs> and then I actually heard it from her friends. She stopped in her tracks. She turned around. She ran after the guy. She leaped up in the air beside him, and she grabbed her his head in the crook of her elbow as she went around, swung around him till she landed on her feet and then threw this guy over her hip, put him on his back and put her form across his throat and took her phone and said, I don't think so. <laughs> and got up and walked away. And then her friends who, who were at the locker standing there, the guy was laying on his back, laying there going, how did she do that? <laughs> So I think she's she's gonna be okay. Yeah, it sounds you know? like it. Um, she's made of but, tipitanium. Uh, <laughs> what did you call it? Tipitanium. Tipitanium. There you go. Yeah, we we wrestled a lot, and she knows I've taught her arm bars and wrist locks, and just kind of wrestled around a bit. So she can look after herself. But it's still scary to have your kids out there in the world when you let them out of the nest, and um, yeah, you can't always be there, right? So. You hope that you you teach them, you know, good things and smart strategic plans to succeed in life, and then hopefully that they they they're okay and they and they they do those things. And there's always a bit of luck and and bad luck in the world and whatnot, but hopefully they surf that sea of uncertainty out in the world there as best they can. Yeah, it sounds so challenging and tough. And I guess there's similarities of of racing. There's certain things you can't control as much as you prepare and. Try to put your best foot right. forward. What a what a challenge! That's beautiful though. The, those stories are are definitely uh, amazing, and and I hope to share some in the future <laughs> with you. If I have kids myself, uh, we're opening e each other up here. It's getting pretty raw. But what does the future hold right. for you? I mean, you've had this incredible career, and then you've been through some dark times. And I think it's so inspirational that you you're back and you're at your best. Um, what does the future hold for you? What does the future hold for me, Sarah? I don't know. What's 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 coming up next? Well, it's been a surprise so far. It's been a surprise so far, she says. That's great. <laughs> Change is constant. Um, yeah. You know what? Like, I'm in a place where um, I'm I'm actually really happy with my job, and I'm happy with my sponsors. And you know, like, I'm not a pro rider just per se anymore. Like, I I do coaching. I do guiding. Um, I do live announcing. I do. Um, you know, a video hosting. And so, you know, I do like a little work for Pink Bike. I do some work for YT uh, Industries and they're going to expand their um, uh, online presence. And I was going to host some videos for them at like, at like Rampage and whatnot. Um, I'm doing all the Canada Cup downhills. So I'm doing more and more Enduros all the time. Um, I've actually started announcing other sports and I've done like some World Cup ski really? races. Um, okay. yeah, World Cup ski race, like downhill and a super G I've done a Red Bull rally car race. Um, I did the BMX World Cup finals as a guest, uh, and are announcer. You, is that for the live um, broadcast or on site? Both, both. live and, awesome. and, and can, Rad. um, and I did some live announcing when they were doing the Red Bull crashed ice, um, with 140,000 people, uh, audience. So I've kind of expanded my announcing. So I'm always looking for more announcing work. Um, if anyone out there wants to hire me, let me know. Find me on Needles Podcast. There we go. Plug, plug. But uh, definitely trying to keep myself in the game <laughs> as best I can and as many different things as I can, coaching, guiding, announcing. And um, I would actually like to get back to artwork because back in the day, I used to airbrush T-shirts and sell them one-of-a-kind T-shirts. And um, I've lost my, my passion for doing art because I'm always so busy. But I'd like to draw and, and sell some paintings again one day. And actually, this is a funny story. Um, one of my snowboard sponsors is One Manufacturing. And they make these stomp pads for between your bindings for some traction when your back foot's out. And one of them is of a comic book character called Radical Rick, who used to be in BMX Plus magazine in the 80s. And Radical Rick was a famous comic book character. And then I posted it on my Instagram. And Damien Fulton... The author, I mean, author, the artist that drew Radical Rick reached out to me and said, dude, that's so cool. Thanks for posting that up. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's so cool. Are you Damien Fulton, the artist that did Radical Rick? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, this is awesome. And so he's like, I want to do Radical Rick trying mountain biking. Can, can I use a photo of you for inspiration no for Radical way. Rick trying mountain biking? And I'm like, of course, yes. And so it hasn't happened yet, but he's looking at using a photo of me riding on a mountain 
was Radical Rick crossing over from BMX to try and mountain biking. And all my BMX friends are so jealous because, you know, he was like a staple growing up in the 80s and, and early 90s. It's, it's, it's like Stan Lee from Marvel That's wanting awesome. a, a, a sh- yeah, it's so crazy. And so he's been like coaching me and, and trying to get me to pick up artwork again. Because like I said, like that drawing I did um, or that painting I showed you of um, my Instagram of dropping clips back in the day, you know, I used to draw, I used to do all this stuff. Um, and uh, I've, I've kind of lost the way, but I want to, to get back to it. And um, I'm going to. So here's a dirt biker that I did. Brah! Another mountain biker dropping off a cliff. And... Uh, and you say um, you're airbrushing those. Is that what I heard correctly? Yeah, hand drawn. Oh, Here's hand a Volkswagen drawn, van sorry. catching big air. Hand drawn. So they're a, a mixture. So like, say this this Volkswagen van, I hand drew with an embroidery pen, but then I would do the background um, with airbrush so that it was like, um, you know, easier to fill in. So the snow, I just airbrushed, oh, but the, awesome. the snowboarder there, I hand drew. There's another cliff dropper on a mountain bike. The dirt I did with like an airbrush. Um, there's some hockey players, Canadian, you know. Well, I mean, and if that's so, a passion of yours, you got to make time for that, surely. Yeah, totally. Here's a water skier that I did. That's cool. And then uh, someone wanted this custom uh, weightlifting shirt. So, anyways, it's an old passion of mine that I haven't done for a long time, but I'd like to get back to it. So the future might involve me getting back to art, and maybe doing. Tippy tees, tippy t-shirts, tippy tees. Or, or, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. What, I don't know, Niels. Something, something to do with art, maybe if I get back to it. But um, maybe once I slow down. But it's tough to slow down when I'm pinned like around the around the calendar, around the clock. <laughs> I'm just looking. We we definitely have to touch on. It's probably most of the questions have been about the same thing. And that is your best dad <laughs> joke. I, I like oh my to start God. wrapping well, it up with, with your best dad joke. Okay, well, I'm going to steal this one. Um, this is one that it's so bad, it's good. <laughs> I love those. <laughs> Why did the man fall in the well? I'm listening. He did not see that well. <laughs> I'm like praying I catch these jokes, but that one I did catch. <laughs> and this one I stole from uh, Graham Agassi. Aggie told me this one on my podcast, and I'll share it with you because I it's just it's just so good. <clears throat> what did one saggy boob say to the other saggy boob? No idea. <laughs> if we don't get some support soon. People are going to think we're not. Oh, yeah. My dad <laughs> told me that one actually back in the day. So it was a real, real dad joke. <laughs> exactly. Oh, I don't know where, but I've heard, like, I have heard that one's great. Uh, oh, my I'm God. I'm showing my age, but it's great. Yeah. Oh Tippy, my God. I will uh, forever cherish this chat, and that's why I started a podcast, is actually to selfishly have some of these catch-ups or nail you down for two hours because there's no ways we could have done this at an event, or at least our attention span wouldn't have lasted that long. <laughs> right, uh, exactly. Well, it's been an honor being on Moving the yeah, Needle. And, thanks uh, so much, man. And just keep up the good work. Yeah, likewise, keep doing you. I hope we see each other. I'm sure we'll cross paths. And uh, for everyone out there, they can reach out to you probably on Instagram, uh, follow you along. Yeah, at Brett It's Tippy. a, gr- it's at a Brett great Tippy. follow. If he's not posting mountain bike stuff or with his family or skiing, snowboarding, he's posting like crazy bears or some. Sh- you, you post, you reshare some pretty cool stuff as well. I'm quite, I'm enjoying Yeah, that. I like the, the gnarly mountain goats go, yes, doing like the extreme descents and like cougars jumping out of trees or just rad athletic things that the animal kingdom does. No. So yeah, thanks Wicked, for that. guys. Well, uh, dude, if you want to be entertained and have high energy, that's your man, Brett Tippy. You know what to do. If you enjoyed this episode, I think maybe share it with a friend because I think uh, Tippy sharing some of his dark moments can be an inspiration. That's all I really ask. Share it with a friend. And maybe hit that follow button. So, guys, till the next one, you know what to do. Stay well. Hey, hey, Needles, smile for me. And I'm going to put you on my Instagram right now. <laughs> dude, you got you to do it gotcha. vertical. Come on, dude.
Oh, you're yeah, right. Okay, okay, you're right. Come on, you're yeah, showing your here. age. Got to do it for a story, <laughs> vertical. <laughs> there we go. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me on, Needles, and uh, good luck to you. And until I see you uh, around the world someplace again. <laughs>